Well, it's the start of a brand new year. Happy New Year. Happy 2024. Start of a new investing year. A lot of people ask, how do I plan my year ahead? So in this video, I'm going to show you the thought process I go through to decide on what stocks to buy, you know, when do I buy the stocks, and what percentage allocation should I add into my portfolio. First, a quick recap about my performance in 2023. Now, if you guys recall, about a year ago, I shared my performance in 2022, which was a bear market. And at that time, my portfolio was down 30%. And this was actually followed by three great years, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And at that point of time, I said that as a, an investor, no matter how great you are, drawdowns are inevitable. You know, you, you can't go in one straight line, your portfolio will go through ups and downs. But the important thing is that when you go through a drawdown, how do you manage your psychology? How do you hold on to great companies, cut the lousy ones, and add more to the good ones? And if you stay the course, you would make back the temporary drawdowns and your portfolio will reach new highs. So one year later, what has happened? Well, so one year later, you can see 2023, my portfolio is up 48% on this portfolio and 43.8% on this portfolio. So take an average of about uh, 45%, right? Basically making back the drawdowns of 2022. And um, total gains in terms of dollars would be about $2 million total gain. So if you take a five-year time frame, you can see my portfolio performance versus the market, the S&P 500. Uh, that's my portfolio in blue over there. And you can see that my portfolio went through a drawdown in 2020 uh, during the COVID crash. Again, a drawdown in 2022. But again, it always goes higher eventually as long as you hold on to great companies that will beat the index. So that's versus the S&P 500. And overall, I'm up 145% over the last five years. Now, given the fact that the last five years, we went through two bear markets, covid pandemic, a banking crisis, a recession, and uh, two wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, um, having 145% return is not too bad. It is acceptable. The good news is I expect the next five years to be a lot more bullish and a lot more profitable than the last five years. And let's see how that turns out. So that brings us to the topic of our video which is how I plan my investments for the year ahead. So I'm here to share with you my thought process that I go through every single year. So step one is to decide how much cash you want to put into the market for the coming year. So for me, what I do is I will calculate a percentage of my income that I plan on saving that I'm going to invest into the market. Now it's different for different people, but I would suggest at least save 10% of your income to put into the market every single year. Remember, investing is not a sprint. It's not a one-time all-in and then pray is gonna go up, no. Investing is a marathon. A marathon that you do consistently over many, many years. So every year you wanna put a bit of money into the market to allow it to compound and grow. And again, at least 10% of your income, could be more, could be 20, 30%, depending on uh, how much you can save. So. I always tell people that the first rule before you even invest is to manage your money well. And the first key to money management is to spend less than you earn so you have a surplus to put aside, to grow your wealth, okay? So that's step number one. Let me write it down for you. Uh, let me just open up this canvas over here. So step one is to um, plan your cash allocation, how much you intend to put into the market for the year, right? So for argument's sake, let's say, you know, you want to put in, um, I don't know, let's say you want to invest, you know, $10,000 into the market for the coming year, right? Could be 100,000, 10,000, 50 grand, it depends on your situation, okay? So that's step number one. Uh, so that's what I do. So step number two is to divide that cash equally by the number of stocks in your portfolio, as equally as possible. So what do I mean? So it's all about diversification. So for example, if your portfolio 
you have, for example, well, let me just write this down, diversify the capital that you want to invest as equally as possible across the stocks in your portfolio, within your portfolio. So for example, if you have uh, 10 stocks in your portfolio, then you want to divide your capital by 10. So that would roughly be a 10% allocation per stock. But if you have 20 stocks in your portfolio, or you plan to have 20 stocks in your portfolio, then each stock would have a 5% allocation, and so on and so forth, all right? Now for me, currently, I've got about 40 stocks in my portfolio, right? Sorry, 40 stocks. So if you take 100% divided by 40, then roughly each of my stocks should have a 2.5% allocation. Got it? Now, this, of course, if you're starting a portfolio from scratch. Now, for someone like me who already has an existing portfolio, the cash I want to invest will not be divided equally. And the reason is because I, in my, my portfolio, I've got certain stocks that already have more than the plan allocation. And I've got certain stocks that are below the plan allocation. So let me give you an example. Like I said, I've got about 40 stocks in my portfolio. And some of my stocks have a much bigger than 2.5% allocation. Now, when I first bought them, they were a small allocation, but they grew organically as the share price increased. So, for example, let me just show you some of my stocks in my portfolio over here. There we are. So, I've got, I own Meta, and you can see Meta makes up 6.5% of my portfolio, which is a lot more than 2.5%. Why? Because Meta over the years has increased in price, so it's grown organically to more than my normal allocation. So as I mentioned in previous videos, when, when a stock grows organically, do I sell the excess to bring down the allocation back to 2.5%? No, I don't, because that's called cutting the flowers, right? You don't want to cut the flowers. As long as it's a great business, the business is growing, it continues to be undervalued or not too far above the intrinsic value, I hold it and let it compound and compound over time. So would I add more money to Meta this year? Probably I won't because I already have a pretty big allocation. Make sense, right? But I've got certain stocks like, for example, LVMH, Louis Vuitton, which I bought the US listed ADR shares, ticker symbol LVMUY. So for this stock, you can see that currently I only have a 0.5% allocation, whereas I want to have at least 2.5%, right? 2.5% is the usual allocation. So for this stock, would I want to allocate more cash to buy the stock more this year? Yes, in order to bring it up to at least 2.5%, okay? Then I've got another stock, for example, you know, S&P Global, which is one of the top financial companies. I have a... Uh, 2.99% allocation, which is again above the 2.5 because it's, it's grown organically. But if I've got ex excess cash to put in, I may put in more to that. So the whole idea is I'm, I'm planning, okay, so for this stock, I'm going to add more cash, this stock not so much, so that I balance it as uh, equally as possible. But for stocks that have really run way above the allocation, I leave it, I don't sell it. Hey, if you want to join me at my Market Outlook event 2024 live in Singapore, you'll be at the Marina Bay Sands on the 20th of January from 9 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. where I'll be joined with Bang and Alson where we'll be sharing with you our in-depth analysis into the year ahead as well as the sectors and stocks and trading strategies we're looking to use to really get another great profitable year ahead. You can click on this link above. The link is also in the description box below. To purchase your tickets, seats are very limited. It's 18 Singapore dollars. That's just 13 plus US dollars just to cover the cost of the venue. And of course, the knowledge and content you're going to learn is going to be priceless to your portfolio. Now, do I plan on adding new stocks to my portfolio to increase the number of stocks? Maybe if I find new stocks. So every year, my priority is to always buy more shares of existing stocks first. That's always the priority. And then the secondary objective is to add new stocks if I find there are stocks that are even better than the ones I already own. I remember many, many years ago, a famous quote by Peter Lynch. He said that the best stocks to buy are the ones that you already own. Because if you already 
already own great companies, just keep adding to those shares. But if you find another type of stock that is just as good or even better, then sure, then you could add that in into your portfolio. So every single year, I'm always looking out for better companies. I'm putting them through my screening process to make sure they meet the criteria of being a great business. As you guys know, I'm very strict. I only invest in the top 1% of stocks in the entire market. So in the US market, there are 6,000 stocks. So 1% times 6,000 is 60 stocks. So the most I can buy will be 60 stocks because if I buy more than 60 stocks, then I'm, I'm more than 1%. And I don't want to go outside the top 1% of high quality stocks. And of course, those of you who have taken my value momentum investing course, you will learn my screening process of how I select these high quality companies. Companies that are very predictable, that are very consistent, that are very resilient. They've got consistent growth in revenue, profits, and free cash flow. Companies that have a sustainable competitive advantage, a wide economic moat, ideally. Companies that, you know, ideally are buying back shares, reducing their shares outstanding. Companies with high return on capital. Companies with conservative debt. So I'm always looking out for these companies. And again, if you subscribe to my uh, Ultimate Investors Playbook, I share with you every month what are some of the best companies in the market. We do a deep dive research. And if we find one that is compelling at the right price, we add it into our portfolio as well. Now, sometimes may I sell certain stocks in my portfolio to give room for new stocks? Yes. So within the stocks I already own, if I feel that, you know, one of them is not as great a business anymore, but it's an okay company. But, you know, I think there's an even better company. I, I could sell that and replace that with another company. So I do that as well. So as you guys know, last year, I decided that Disney, uh, it's a stock which I own. I decided that, you know, what I, I think I can. there are much better companies out there than Disney. I'm not saying Disney is a bad company, but there are better companies, more predictable, more resilient. I sold Disney. I sold Tencent as well because Tencent, again, I'm not saying it's a bad company, but I can find a lot more predictable companies that have got less risk of regulations affecting their business model. So I sold Tencent, I sold Disney, and I'll replace them with even stronger and better companies. So once I've decided how much money to allocate for each stock. For example, I may say, okay, I intend to uh, invest 10,000 into LVMH. I intend to invest another, you know, 8,000 into SPGI, another 10,000 into, you know, Home Depot, whatever it is, right? So once I have planned how much to allocate, then I'll buy only when the share price drops to my buy level. So which is step number three. Step number three is I will buy only when the share price drops to my intended buy level, which is the share price must drop enough such that it is undervalued. It must be below the intrinsic value before I would buy the shares. And number two, it must retrace to a, to a significant support level on the charts. And as usual, I never buy at one go. I always buy in tranches. So what does that mean? So for example, if I plan to invest another 10,000 into LVMH, for example, and it reaches the first buy level, I would buy a quarter of that plan allocation. So I'll buy 2,500 worth of shares first. And if the price drops to the next support level, next buy level, I then buy another 25%, which is another 2,005. And the lower it drops, the more I invest until I've got a fully allocated position if it drops all the way down to the last support level. So in other words, if I plan to invest a certain amount into the markets this year, would I end up buying everything? No. For example, if for the whole of 2024, the market doesn't go down. If the market keeps going up, then I may not buy anything because the price never dropped to my intended buy level. Or if the market drops but doesn't drop too much, then I may only end up buying half of what I intend to buy this year. But if the market drops a lot this year, market goes down 20-30%, I'll be very happy because then it will drop to my buy levels, it gets cheap enough and I'll put in my full position. So how much I end up buying this year depends on how low the market goes. The lower the market goes, the more I buy. If the market doesn't drop at all, I end up buying nothing and I may end the year 
with all my cash and I'll just roll it over to the next year. And then maybe next year when it crashes, then I go all in, for example. Well, yeah, not all in, but I'll buy in tranches. So let me show you an example on one of the stocks. LVMUI, this is Louis Vuitton, which is one of the highest quality stocks from the European Union, all right? They make all these luxury bags and, and clothes and stuff like that, right? So I, I already own this share, but I have a very small allocation. So this year, I'm hoping to you know, buy a lot more of the shares. And for example, I intend to buy about another, you know, $30,000 worth of LVUMY, for example. And I have determined that my buy levels are 148, 143, and 133. Now you may say, how did you decide on the buy levels? I use technical analysis and I identify significant levels of support based on uh, various time frames, the monthly, weekly, and daily time frames. But I won't go into that into detail because we teach that in, in the courses. Now, for LVMUI, I've calculated that the intrinsic value, base case, is 155. That's the intrinsic value. That's what the shares are worth. So I only want to buy it if it gets back below 155. As you can see, it was below 155 last year, and that's why I bought a bit, but it went up too fast for me to add more. So I'm hoping that this year, if you can get back below 155, I can complete my buying to get my full 2.5% allocation. So as I said, uh, I've identified three support levels, 149, thereabouts, 143, and 133. And what I do for my subscribers is that every month I do a portfolio review of every stock. I recalculate the intrinsic value so, so they know for each stock, what is the valuation? And I show them every month what are the buy levels where I would start adding shares, right? So hopefully, hopefully, if this stock can drop to 148, then I'll buy one third of my planned allocation. So for example, I intend to buy 30,000 worth of this stock. If it drops to 148, I'll buy $10,000 worth of stock first. Then if it drops further to 143, I buy another 10,000. If it drops to the last support level, then I'm fully in with my 30 grand and hopefully that brings up my allocation to uh, uh, an allocation level that I want in my portfolio. Now what if the stock never comes down? What if it just flies all the way up? Then I don't buy anything. So that's the discipline. So one of the things is I never chase the girl. If the girl is running away, I never chase the girl because she will lose all respect for you. I wait for the girl to run to me when she's scared into my loving arms, all right? And if she doesn't run to me this year, she'll run to me next year, right? Eventually, she will run to me. And again, that's the discipline of investing. Now, having said that, bear in mind that for great companies, the intrinsic value will rise every year. So I do a revaluation. So next year, this intrinsic value of 155, it may go up to 170, 180, right? Similarly, these support levels I draw, as the price goes up, they will be revised as well, either upwards or downwards. So it is always a revision of my intrinsic value of my buy levels, so I know exactly when I start buying shares. It is not based on emotions, it's not based on predictions, it's based on all these uh, objective uh, technical and fundamental rules. After rising 24% or more than 24% in 2023, the market S&P 500 looks a bit overextended right now. So although I do expect 2024 to end with a gain by the end of the year, but I do expect there to be at least a pullback or correction uh, soon. I can't tell you exactly when, but my guess would be probably in yeah, maybe the first quarter of the year or maybe even lasting to the first half of the year. Remember, prices don't go up in a straight line. They never go up in a straight line. They go through wave patterns, right? So you've got wave up, you've got wave down, you got wave up, you got wave down, now it's wave up, wave up, right? Can't wave up forever. Eventually it's gonna wave down. <laughs> so I'm waiting for the wave down. Uh, for me to start adding shares of my favorite companies. Now, again, the question is always, you know, where's the top? When is it going to come down? You know, we, we can guess, but no one knows for sure. Uh, but, you know, we, we can always use certain tools to make educated guesses. But again, they're not 100%. They're just, you know, guessing, right? 
So if I use my Fibonacci tool, where I look at the impulsive wave up, there we are, that's the wave up A to B, B to C, I can project using my Fibonacci projection tool that the possible end of this wave up based on Fibonacci is at 4918, at the 100% projection level, which means we could wave up to there and then we will then correct down to maybe uh, at least the 20 EMA on weekly candles, which is about 4,005, right? So we go up there, we correct down here, and then we then continue the uptrend. Now again, will it exactly happen this way? Of course not. But this is, you know, something that is just a possibility. Now, it's the same thing with individual stocks. For example, look at Meta, which was the best performer in 2023. If you look at Meta, you can see that uh, it's been on a very, very strong wave up pattern. And by the way, if you calculate the intrinsic value, uh, my valuation is about $411. So I think that at 335, sorry, 350, uh, 353, my bad, uh, Meta is still undervalued. Okay, so I still think it's, it's, it's still cheap. But having said that, even though it's still cheap, uh, it is technically a bit overextended. So again, what, that's, what, what does that mean? Now, if I go down to the daily candles, let's take a closer look at the daily candles that we are. So check it out. Again, wave patterns, right? Although it's fundamentally cheap, and I, I, I believe that Meta will keep going up in the many, many years to come, but it will not go up in a straight line. It will go through these wave patterns, right? Wave up, wave down, wave up, wave down, wave up, right? And now it could be waving down first, right? Before it waves up again. So it will go through these uh, ups and downs. So the important thing as an investor is to, you know, when it's waving up, that's when people are all optimistic. They're chasing the stock. That's when we don't want to chase the stock. Never chase the girl. Let it run, right? You need to wait for the wave down for the panic, the correction, the bad news, and then you start adding once it has waved down to a strong level of support, which could be a moving average or a uh, support level that you have identified. A very common question I get from people is, Adam, if you think that a stock like Meta, for example, is you know at the end of the wave up or near the end of the wave up and it's going to retrace soon, then doesn't it make sense to sell the shares when it's high and then after it drops, you buy it back again. The answer really depends on your personal situation. So what I, what I tell my students is this. I say that if you need the cash for whatever reason, for example, you need to raise cash uh, for your personal expenses, like you need to you know, renovate your house, for example, you need to buy a new car, then would now be a time to sell shares of Meta? Yes, because you need to raise the cash. Or if, for example, you don't have extra savings to put into the market this year and you want to buy a stock and you don't have the cash to buy a stock and you want to raise some cash from existing stocks to buy new stocks or to buy this stock when it gets lower, then yes, it makes sense to sell when it's near the end of a wave up pattern. Or for those of you who have bought on margin, which means you bought using board from funds from the broker and now you have, you're sitting on very good returns. If I were you, I would sell everything right now. I would sell in order to bring my margin to zero. It doesn't make sense right now to own stocks on margin for two reasons. Number one, interest rates are still high. And if you're buying stocks on margin, you're paying a lot of interest on your margin account. Number two, when, not if, but when the market corrects down, a lot of your profits will be evaporated if you're on high margin, okay? So I repeat, if you need the cash to buy something or you need to raise the cash so that when the market drops later in the year, you have money to buy, or if you need, uh, or if you're on margin, then yes, now, if I were you, I would sell my shares. If not all the shares, sell one third or sell half at least, okay? And then when the market corrects back down uh, in the later part of the year, then yeah, you could, you know, buy it back and so and so forth, okay? However, if you are like me and I don't need the cash because I have got more cash coming in from my savings to put into the market, then I'm not selling my Meta shares, even though I think there's a chance it's going to go down. 
Now you may say, why? Why don't you sell and buy it back? Because over the years, I've learned my lesson that if you own a very, very good company and you know that this good company is going to keep growing over the years and you try to jump in and out in the short term, sometimes you can. Sometimes you can get lucky and right after you sell, right, it drops down and you buy it back and it goes up and you go, yes, I'm good, right? And it happens once in a while and you feel really good. But there were also many times in my life where I owned great companies like Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and I've owned them for many, many years. But what happened is after a strong wave up, I thought that, hey, it's really so high. And after I sold it, guess what happened? It kept going high, it went, ah, right? <laughs> and it went up another 50, 100%, and I was no longer in that great business. And even though it retraced later on, even after the drop, it was still above where I got out and I could never get back in again until much longer and I missed out a lot of gains and that has happened to me before. You know, I bought Microsoft, for example, 15, 20 years ago and, you know, if I just held on to my shares through those ups and downs, today, I'll be a lot richer compared to me selling and buying back and missing out a lot of gains when I got out, right? And there were also many times in my life where, you know, I sold and sure enough, after I sold, it dropped back down. I go, yes, I'm so smart. And so I'm going to buy it back. I'm going to buy it back. And I said, I'm going to buy it back when it reaches this support level over there. But before I could buy and before it reached a support level, boom, it went up so fast that again, it left without me. And it went up another 100%, right? So I've learned my lesson. And I learned that if I'm holding great companies that I know will keep growing in the long run and I don't need the cash right now, I'm not going to sell it. I'm just going to hold it, right? And even if it drops, you know, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20%, you know, it's fine. I'll just add more shares when it goes down because I've got more cash coming in. But at the same time, in order to generate some additional income while my favorite stock is retracing down or consolidating, what I do is I sell covered call options against my position. And for those of you who have taken our option courses, you know what I'm talking about. We sell call options that are out of the money. So for example, just a few days ago, I sold call options against my meta stock at a strike price of $380 strike price. So what does that mean? Let me just show you. Um, this is my account there. So you can see that for every 100 shares of meta that I own, I sold one contract of call options. And I sold the call options at a price of about close to $8. So one contract is 100 shares, $8 times 100 is $800 I collect in premium from the market. And I sold six contracts. So six contracts times $800, that's $4,800 of free money that I'm getting by selling these call options. Free money, right? So, but you may say, nothing's free in life. There's, there's a catch, right? Yeah, so what's the catch? The catch is very simple. So again, I sell these call options at a strike price of 380, right? I, I'm collecting $800 of premium per contract. I sold six contracts, so I'm collecting $4,800 of premium from my option sale, okay? Now, these options will expire in about 40 days. Let me just double check that. Yep, they expire on the uh, 2nd of February, right? In about, yeah, 30 to 40 days. So what happens is in the next 30 to 40 days, if Meta goes down or if it goes sideways or if it goes up but below 380, right? Stays below 380 or it may even go above 380 but by the expiration date, it goes back below 380, what happens? then the call options I sold will become worthless at expiration and I will just keep this $4,800 of free money. So I win, right? But what if, what if Meta goes up above 380 by the expiration date and stays there? Then what happens? Then I may be obligated to sell my shares at 380. Now, What's the cost of my meta shares? 
the cost of my meta shares, as you can see over here, uh, my cost price is 169, right? So if I bought meta at 169, let me write this down, right? If I bought meta at 169, and now I'm selling it at 380, do I make money? Yes, but not only do I sell it at 380, but I also keep the $8 premium, which I sold. So my net sales price will be 388. So if I sell Meta at 388, when my cost is 169, I get a huge profit, which I also win. So can you see that for me, it is a win-win scenario. If Meta goes up and I'm forced to sell my shares at 380 plus $8 premium, I win. I make a lot of profits. But if Meta goes sideways, or goes down, or goes up a bit, I get free money. So selling covered costs is a win-win situation as long as you already own great high quality companies. Now, some of you may say, but Adam, what if you don't want to sell your shares? Now, if I don't want to sell my shares, what I can do is I can buy back the call options at a small loss and resell new call options for new premium at a higher strike price at a further expiration date to pay for the loss of the old call options. And that's what we call rolling up the call. And that's something that we teach uh, in the options course in detail. So that's really a win-win-win scenario. So it's fantastic when you can combine options with your investments. It will turbocharge your returns. Now, if you want to find out my in-depth analysis into what I think is going to happen to the markets in 2024, what are the specific sectors that will outperform and specific stocks that I'm looking at that will outperform the market in 2024, you can join me in the Outlook 2024 event, but it's happening only in Singapore. It's a event that's going to be live at the Marina Bay Sands. It's a full day event from 9 a.m. to 6.30 p.m on the 20th of January. So if you're from Singapore, do join us. If, if you're you know, overseas, you wanna fly into Singapore to meet myself and Bang and Elson, where they'll be also joining me on stage. We welcome and we love to see you there as well. And you can click on this link up here. I'll also put the link in the description box below where you can click on it. And you can purchase your tickets at just 18 Singapore dollars. That's about 13 plus US dollars just to cover the cost of the venue. And of course, all the knowledge or the content you're going to learn, uh, that's a huge bonus. So look forward to seeing you there if you can make the date. Take care. I'll see you soon.